morning. Wasn't that a beautiful time of worship? To remember our Lord, his sacrifice, his resurrection through, through the taking of the bread and the cup and song and praise. I hope your soul was blessed like it was mine. Uh, if you have your Bible, please open it with me to Acts chapter 2. And it might be helpful for you to turn also uh, to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Later in the message, we're going to be going verse by verse uh, through the end of that passage as well. We're in a series of messages called Church Life, uh, where the, we're looking at Acts chapter 2 as the church is born. It comes to life. Uh, that first Jerusalem, uh, Church of Jerusalem, and we're learning from them what they were focused on. Uh, and I think we learn a lot about what our agenda should be as a church as well, because God has set our agenda, and it's a beautiful example of that in Acts chapter 2. We know that after Jesus was crucified and after he rose from the dead, some uh, 40 days later, uh, 50 days later, rather, uh, 50 days later, the Spirit of God came upon the disciples after he had ascended into heaven. And that was the day of Pentecost. And Peter is empowered by the Spirit, and he gets up and he, he proclaims the message of the gospel in great power. Now, we read the response of it in verse number 41. We hear from God. This is the passage of Scripture uh, that we'll be looking at every single week throughout this series. We read, then those who gladly received his word. I hope you don't skip over that part. They were happy to receive God's word. I hope you're happy this morning. Those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and prayers. And then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple... And breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. <clears throat> These verses of the Jerusalem church are a wonderful blueprint for Valley Baptist. Now, we're going to begin in verse number 42 this morning. It says, they continued steadfastly, and I want to pause right there. The 3,000 who received the word and were baptized and added to the church continued. <laughs> they continued steadfastly. You know, one of the marks of genuine Christianity is that it continues, right? A faith that doesn't continue is not really faith. Now, that doesn't mean that we continue in sinless perfection, obviously, but it does mean that we persevere to the end. Dr. Adrian Rogers said one time about some church members, he said, some church members remind me of Alka-Seltzer. You baptize them in water, they sizzle, and then they disappear. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's true sometimes, isn't it? Someone makes a profession of faith, but it's, their faith hasn't been rooted properly, genuinely in Christ, and yet they just, they just kind of disappear. They, fi they fizzle out before it takes root. Philippians chapter 1 Verse 6 says, being confident of this very thing, that he, that's God, who began a good work in you, will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Genuine believers continue. Now, we're not saved because we continue. We continue because we're saved. Now, what did the first church continue in? Well, that's what we're going to look at in the coming weeks, beginning this week. The first thing they continued in, it says, was the apostles' doctrine. And that's the focus of the message. That little phrase is the focus of this morning's message. The title of this morning's message is, The Word Feeds the Life of the Church. You see, every living organism needs food, right? Every living organism needs nutrients in order to, to grow and, and to live and to flourish and to multiply. And the nourishment for every Christian in every church is the Word of God. That's our food. There is no substitute for it. We must feed on it, right? Now, the early church, uh, it says, uh, fed on the apostles' doctrine. 
Uh, they fed on it when, in large group gatherings when the 3,000 plus were gathered in the temple in Solomon's porch, but they also fed on it in small groups as they continued house to house, Acts 2 says. Now, the word doctrine kind of scares pe- some people. They, they think, oh man, that's a big word. It's kind of an archaic word in our culture, but it's simply the Greek word didache, which means teaching. It's used 30 times in the New Testament. They continue in the apostles' teaching. Now, I believe there's a reason that Luke, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, lists doctrine as the first thing they continued in. I think it's a statement of priority. Because if God's truth goes, everything else goes with it, doesn't it? Satan knows that all too well. For the first temptation of Eve, we read in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Now the serpent, that's Satan, was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Satan questions God's word here. A couple of verses later, he contradicts God's word. If the truth of God's word is questioned or twisted or neglected in a church, everything else in that church of significance is going to fall apart as well. Now, unfortunately, truth is under attack in our culture, isn't it? Objective truth is scorned because objective truth points to an objective truth giver. It points to God, ultimately speaking. Truth is so hated in our culture that even the most obvious and self-evident truths are now scorned and attacked. The most glaring example is that a boy is a boy and a girl is a girl. An attack on God's gender assignment is an attack on God as a creator, right? It's, a, it's ultimately an attack on God. But, but does objective truth really actually exist? Now, that question is as old as Pontius Pilate when he looked at Jesus and he said, what is truth? You know, Pontius Pilate, I guess, was kind of the original postmodern kind of guy. You see, attacks on truth is as old as sin itself. All the way back in the garden, Satan was attacking the truth of God. And it, it seems, though, in our culture, in our world, it's taken on new heights, right? Our culture's most precious doctrine is now self-truth. Now, this is true for me. It may not be true for you, but this is true for me. Or someone will say, you be true to yourself. Or you're the truth. No, 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 no. Jesus is the truth. Our culture disdains the concept of objective truth that that is outside of one's personal experience and personalized self-truth. Now, their hatred for objective truth is mainly directed at God, who's the giver of that objective truth, right? Now, we know that in our culture, uh, spiritual truth and moral truth is not the only thing under attack, is it? Basic biology is under attack. We live in a world where people of prominence can be asked a question in front of a camera and a crowd about uh, what a woman is. And they stumble, I don't know how to define a woman, because it might offend someone's self-truth. Now, thankfully, so far at least, math hasn't come under attack. We know 2 plus 2 equals 4, right? Now, it does not matter. If someone comes along and says, you know what? I really feel internally like 2 plus 2 equals 5. That's my self-truth. It does not matter what a person declares they believe to be true. 2 plus 2 equals 4. It's a fixed mathematical law that God created that governs our world. It's a fixed truth. Now, there's also fixed physical laws that govern our world. One example is is the law of gravity, right? The law of gravity doesn't change and fluctuate. Uh, It's designed based on a person's personalized truth, their self-truth. I knew a man who attended our church uh, who sadly became a diagnosed schizophrenic. Now, he didn't believe he was a woman. This man believed he was Superman, and he genuinely, sincerely believed it. Now, Just because he sincerely believed and identified as Superman, that self-truth of his that he held on to did not give him the ability to fly because that self-truth was not true. It was a lie. He had been deceived in his mind. In fact, sadly, this man jumped out of a multi-storied building thinking he was going to fly as Superman. And 
And just because he believed it, he did not defy gravity based on that sincerely held truth. Sadly, he demonstrated it. He broke his neck and eventually died of the injuries. Objective truth is real. And we operate by it on a daily basis, even if our society wants us to check our brains at the door of reality. Objective truth is real. Now, here's the deal. Just like objective truth relates to mathematics and gender and physics and all these self-evident things, there's also objective truth when it comes to morality and spirituality. This book right here, the Word of God, is our objective truth because it's God's revelation of Himself to us. The uh, early church, it says in Acts 2, verse 42, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Well, what does that mean exactly? We know they have the Old Testament Scriptures, but the New Testament Scriptures that we have, they didn't have yet. It hadn't been written. But we do know that the night before Jesus was crucified, He promised that the disciples, uh, He said the Holy Spirit's going to come, He's going to teach you and guide you into all truth. Those disciples eventually became the apostles. Now, while the Holy Spirit illuminates and brings to light understanding and brings to life His Word, and He guides us as believers into all truth, that promise was really specifically given to the disciples who became the apostles. The apostles, they taught authoritatively because they taught the very Word of God without error. The Holy Spirit inspired them to teach unerring truth, and thankfully, in God's providence, he had him, them write a lot of it down. It was preserved for us as the Word of God. So clearly, uh, it's very clear that our teaching today should be straight from the infallible Scriptures that God inspired and preserved through the apostles. Now, unfortunately, sadly, there, there are some churches today uh, who seem to emphasize everything in their church services except for the Word of God. Their messages seem to be uh, counseling sessions or motivational uh, speeches, but our philosophy as pastors at Valley has always been, why don't we do our best to get out of the way and proclaim what God has said? That's our goal. People don't need to hear what new thing I have, I have to come up with. They need to hear from God. Amen? We long to, to, to hear a, a word from God for our heart, for our life. In Ephesians chapter 4, God tells me that He has made me a pastor in order to help build up His church. The best way for me to do that as a pastor is to teach God's Word. That's the gifting He's given me. That's the position. The Jerusalem church, uh, they were kind of a spiritual nursery, weren't they? I mean, in a moment, 3,000 people in one day are born again. They become spiritual babies in Christ. Now, I'm sure that panicked the, the apostles. What are they going to do with all these babies? Well, what do you do with a baby? You feed it, right? So they fed them. They fed them the Word of God. 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, beginning of verse number 2, it says, As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. Perhaps Peter who's up in years, is towards the end of his life, when he's writing uh, this epistle, he's sort of thinking in his mind, he's remembering as he's writing it that day of Pentecost with all these baby Christians, uh, what are we going to do with this massive spiritual nursery? Here's what we're going to do. We're going to feed them the milk of the Word, the milk of the truth that they may grow. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. That must be the priority of Valley Baptist when we gather to continue in the sound doctrine of the Word of God, to declare what God has declared, to teach what God has taught, because it's only through the power of His Word that God transforms lives. That's what the Spirit of God uses. He uses His Word. Whenever a church moves away from the teaching of the Word, no matter how overtly or how subtly, they have just taken up their own agenda instead of God's agenda. God gave us the agenda. He gave us the instructions. He gave us the way, and He preserved it in His Word. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he says that, that, that it's through the foolishness of preaching that God has chosen to save those who believe. You know, to the culture, what I'm doing right now is kind of foolishness, right? 
A guy stands up for 30 or 40 minutes, and he starts talking about this man who lived centuries ago in, in Galilee, and he lived a perfect life. He did miracles. He died on a bloody cross. He was raised on the third day. If you believe in him, you're going to live forever. That message is foolishness to those who don't believe. But to those of us who do believe, that message is the power of God unto salvation. Something happens in us. The Word of God comes alive in us. It's so easy for churches to get distracted by maybe, maybe a pastor uh, has a particular passage or a particular truth that really resonates, and he just focuses in on that. Or they get sidetracked into, to, to politics and, and, and social issues, or they get sidetracked into entertaining for the purpose of gathering a crowd. A pastor sometimes can be a stand-up a comedian, scratching, itching ears instead of being a herald, declaring the king's arrival and the king's commands. We are to teach God's word. That's why when we stand up to preach at Valley Baptist, we begin by asking, would you open your Bibles and turn to a particular passage? Because the preacher has no authority apart from the authority of God's Word. It's only, it's only what he has said that's authoritative. Now, for the remainder of our time, uh, we're going to turn to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. So if you would turn there uh, in your Bible, I think it will be handy. We'll have the verses on the screen. We're going to go verse by verse through the end of that and on into chapter 4. Paul tells young Timothy, who's a young pastor, he warns them in chapter 3. He says, imposters are coming. There's going to be false teachers. They're going to take the word. They're going to twist it. They're going to deceive because they've been deceived. Then he tells Timothy, after he warns them, he says, I want you to continue in the word. And then in verse number 16 of chapter 3, he says, All Scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Here's the first principle. The Bible is the uniquely inspired Word of God. There's no other book like it on earth. God uniquely spoke into it, and we have it. The Bible is simply a term that's used to refer to the, the holy scriptures that were inspired by God, and they were written down by men. You know, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, I think is perhaps the greatest verse in the Bible about the Bible. It teaches us that it's the very word of God. The word inspired means God breathed. He, he inspired it in spirit. The Holy Spirit breathed it. The Spirit of God breathed out His Word. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 20 says, Knowing this, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. God used human beings to write Scripture, because, and He used it not by dictation, it's not as if they were possessed in the sense that Paul and Peter and Luke and, and all these guys that, that God used, it's not as if it, he dictated it and they were uninvolved. No, no, no. That's not how the Word of God was inspired. He, God used their personality. He used their context, their historical context, their circumstance, and he inspired them to write exactly the truth he wanted them to write. The very words were inspired. The very tense of the verbs are inspired by God. The Bible is God's inspired word. And if it is, and it is, that means it's without any mixture of error, right? Because God's a God of truth. Anything God speaks, there's no error in it. Zero error. The scriptures are God's self-disclosure of himself. Now, you want to know what God's like. A lot of people are like, what? I just wish I knew what God's like. Read it. Read it. Take it in. Hear from God yourself. Look to his word, and most specifically, look to Jesus Christ, who is the incarnate word, the word of God that became flesh. Now, some get concerned in today's day and age about uh, the rise of atheism. But when you really look at it carefully, uh, there aren't that many atheists in the world, uh, statistically. But there are a growing number of of people who we could kind of lump in and call them deists. They're spiritual in the sense that they believe God is, but they don't believe God is knowable. He's unknowable. 
Thomas Jefferson, one of our founding fathers, was perhaps one of the most famous deists uh, of our country. The deist believes that God created the world, wound it up like a clock with laws that he gave it, and sits by while that clock just ticks. He created the world, he, sp he spins it on its axis, it's spinning, but he sits by uninvolved, uninterested. But here's the deal. God not only created the world, God's involved in the world. He entered the world because he loved it so much. God not only desires that people know he exists intellectually because it rationally makes sense, he wants people to know him personally. So he made himself known. Through creation, we, we, creation speaks of the existence of God. Through the conscience, the mind, the rash, the, uh, rationally we know that God exists, but also through his word, and most specifically, himself in the form of Jesus. Now here's the catch. God wants us to interact with his word, not just so we know he exists, but so that we know him personally, that we personalize it, that we enter a relationship with him that's based on the truth of who he is and what he's done and what he's doing in the promise of his presence. You know, the Bible is a uniquely inspired word of God, but another principle that we have this morning is the Bible teaches us how to be saved. We'll be quick here. Just back up one verse with me to verse 15. We'll just kind of catch it mid-sentence. It says, and that from childhood, he's talking to Timothy, you've known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. It's through the Scriptures, through the Bible, that we learn that, that God is good, that God is loving. We learn not only He exists, but we know something about Him, but we also learn about His expectations. What does he expect of us? And when we learn about his law and his expectations, we also learn we have failed. We are sinners. We have fallen short of his glory. We've sinned. But God also makes us wise through his word, through the scriptures, to salvation because we recognize and we hear God's plan that he's provided a savior to rescue us from our sin. Jesus died on the cross. He rose the third day. We learn that salvation is through faith which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, back to verse number 16. We read again, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, and then listen to this, this is a beautiful part, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. Here's the principle. The Bible teaches us what to believe and how to behave. That's what it says. He says it's profitable, and then he lists four things it's profitable for. It's profitable for doctrine, that's that word didache, teaching. This is what we should believe. But it's also profitable for reproof. That's what we should not believe. It's profitable for correction, that's what we should not do. And then it's profitable for instruction in righteousness, that's what we should do. You see, the Bible is God's complete handbook for how to think and how to live how to believe, but also how to behave. Some churches in their teaching emphasize our way to God while neglecting to talk about our walk with God. So you, oftentimes you have a lot of a big church with a lot of spiritual babies. They still steer clear of teaching about right living for the Christian. They're afraid to talk about uh, morality and right living uh, that in a way that maybe it's going to distract from grace. But God didn't, didn't have that fear, did he, when he gave us his word? He gave us his law. He gave us his grace and the message of grace and faith in his son, Jesus Christ. And then he gave us, here's the fruit I'm going to produce as I sanctify you by my word. Some of these churches that emphasize belief without behavior, uh, they could be classified as antinomian, anti-law, antinomian. Antinomian Christians are people who believe that the moral law doesn't apply to us under the gospel of grace. But we know that God is not anti-law, is he? Because God gave us the law. Uh, our Christian morals and ideals come from his nature. It's his revelation. The law is a gracious gift to us that shows us our need for a savior. But the law also shows us God's ideal that he's developing us into as we're conformed into the image of his son. Other churches do the opposite, though. 
and they err on the opposite side. They emphasize behaving without believing. They emphasize doing instead of being. You ever come across a pastor like that? Sometimes when we will be exposed to a pastor amongst ourselves, we'll kind of say, well, that, that, that preacher, he's a good, he's a do better preacher. Do better. Just live right. Just do better. But we know Christianity isn't about doing as much as it's about being, right? The Christian message is that it's God who transforms our nature through faith in Christ. It's God who sanctifies us. It's God who produces fruit in our life. But here's the deal. We don't have to emphasize believing or behaving to the neglect of the other because God doesn't do that. That's what verse 16 says. It's profitable for all of it. It's sufficient for all of it. That's one of the great things about expository preaching that we do here at Valley. Most of the time, we, we open up a book and we, we go verse by verse through that book, teaching it verse by verse, which means, inevitably, we're going to teach about how we're to believe and how we are saved and sanctified and grow by His grace. But we're also, inevitably, going to teach about the responsibility we have to obey God's commands. Because God tells us clearly, don't be just a hearer of the word, be a doer. All scripture is profitable for what we believe and how we're to live, all right? Another principle that we see from this passage is the Bible is sufficient nourishment for spiritual maturity. It's sufficient nourishment for spiritual maturity. It's the word of God that feeds the life of the church. Nothing else is able to provide the church the nutrients it needs to thrive. In verse number 17, Paul says, it's profitable, but then in verse 17 he says, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. He says, the word of God is sufficient to make you spiritually mature. John chapter 17, verse 17, Jesus said, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. You're going to be sanctified. That's that process by which God takes you from this new baby in Christ into maturity. This process of producing fruit in your life. This process of uh, uh, of being transformed into being more like the image of Jesus. Jesus said we're sanctified, how? By the truth of his word. Which means every one of us should be hearing from God every day. It's not enough to come on Sundays and be fed. We're going to try to feed you a good meal. That's not enough. You're going to get real hungry, real weak throughout the week. Every day we should be living on the bread of life. It's through God's word that that he renews our minds. And boy, do we need that, right? In the world in which we live, there's all sorts of corrupt messaging. Did you know that that Americans on average receive about a thousand advertisements a day? That's a conservative number I read this week. Add to that the messaging from TV and music and social media and and, and all of these. We're overloaded with messaging, and most of those messages are corrupt. They're distorted. They bring distortion to, to the way God wants us to think and see the world. You see, God gives us a lens by which we see the world. It's his word. It's like you a person that can't hardly see, they're, it's kind of blurry, they put on some glasses. The, we're, it's blurry, the world's blurry spiritually until we look through the lens of God's word. It, his message to us, we need to take it in every day. Psalm chapter 1, uh, one of my favorite uh, chapters in all the word of God, it says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornerful. But His delight is in the law of the Lord. He loves it. And and in his law, he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in a season whose leaf also shall not wither and whatever he does shall prosper. We're to delight and love God's word and meditate, chew on it, uh, marinate on it every day and every night. That means as a church, we got to be self-feeders. We cannot be 100% reliant on someone else to spoon-feed us the Word of God. We've got to learn to take it in our alone time with God. Now, for some of you, 
who first become a Christian, you're a baby Christian, it's going to be helpful that someone in our church family kind of adopts you and starts bottle feeding you and spoon feeding you the word for a while, but you should be striving to take God's word in on your own every day. Now, my boys, uh, I've got two boys, and they've both been brainwashed by Pastor Phil into loving rattlesnakes. <laughs> True. And uh, I don't get it. I don't get it, but every time my oldest in particular, this time of year, he starts begging me to drive up Granite Mountain Road and go look for some snakes. Now, I hate snakes. I, I, I hate snakes. I don't want to be around snakes. I don't want to look at a snake. But I love my boys, so I try to take them as often as I can. Now, we've driven along that road across Pozo Creek dozens of times. And if you're familiar with Granite Mountain Road, you kind of hang a right and then, a, and then a left, and you cross the creek right there. Now, one thing that fascinates me every time I drive by is it's kind of barren, right? Especially during the summer, it's not real high in elevation yet. It's hot, it's dry, it's golden hills, it's barren. And then right as you come to that creek, suddenly there's these large, huge, healthy trees. It's beauty. Why? It's because they're planted there by the rivers of water that run part of the year. That's the only reason they can uh, be alive and healthy in the middle of this hot, dry, Bakersfield climate in which we live. Here's the deal. Spiritually speaking, every one of us live in a hot, dry desert of a world. We must learn. Like Psalm chapter 1 says, we must learn to plant our lives by the rivers of God's Word where we're nourished in order to be healthy and grow and to feed on what God wants us to feed on. And if we do, if we do that seed of faith that was planted in our heart by the Holy Spirit, that seed of life that began to sprout, it is nourished and it grows into this massive tree whose leaf does not wither, who produces fruit and whatever he does shall prosper. You see, a river brings nutrients for the tree, water, living water for life, and God's Word brings that to us spiritually. It's our nutrients. We better be feeding on it. It's interesting to me as I read through Scripture, so many of the metaphors that God uses for, word, uh, for His Word is connected to food. Sometimes Scripture is referred to as bread or the milk of the Word or the meat of the Word. Those metaphors relate to food. The Bible is our spiritual food. You, you wouldn't think about going a week, uh, weeks at a time without eating physically. It, yet some people do that. Some people are just weak and anemic because they're spiritual anorexics. They're not eating. They're not taking it in. They're not being nourished. Have you been taking God's word in with a humble and teachable heart, ready to hear from him? If not, you're going to grow weak and anemic spiritually. It says that Scripture is profitable in such a way that a man could be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. You see, the truth of God, His Word is the primary mechanism God uses to produce spiritual life in us. In fact, without it, there's no one who would be spiritually mature. Now, let me give a word of caution for our church family. Occasionally, some believe that they need to seek out additional words from God. That, that the word is, isn't enough, that they wish so bad that God would speak directly to them in addition to his written word. Some branches of the charismatic movement emphasize that there's the word of God, but there's also the word of God, a personal word from God, apart from the word. Personal divine revelation that the Holy Spirit gives. Let me caution you about that. In Revelation chapter 22, at the end of the last chapter, very last page of your Bible, God pronounces a judgment on anyone who adds or takes away from this book. God told us his authoritative revelation is complete so that the man of God can be complete as well. So I just like to caution us in saying that God spoke us a word to us apart from his word. Because if God did, that means it would be authoritative. And that has massive implications. Now, you may say, well, I've felt the Holy Spirit speak to me before. I know exactly what you mean because I've felt the same thing. But the Holy Spirit doesn't speak to us new words of revelation 
He speaks to our heart and our mind about existing words of revelation, how to apply it to our life, specific areas that he's convicting us in or guiding us in or, or prompting us in to prompt us to share our faith to a particular person. I believe the Holy Spirit does those things. He doesn't give us new informational content, though, for the Bible is sufficient to make us spiritually complete. So what does the Spirit do? He illuminates. He brings the Word to light in a way that we understand that it comes to life in us. The, the Spirit also brings to memory truths that we've been exposed to a, according to His Word. He assists us in knowing how to apply God's Word to specific areas of our life. He shows us specific ways we are to trust Him and obey Him in His Word. He gives us wisdom and guidance to make godly decisions. All of that is very appropriate and biblically grounded. But all of that that I mentioned is in alignment with and out of His written Word. It is not a new word apart from this that's being implanted. Now, perhaps it was new to you because He brought it to light, brought it to light, but it's nothing in addition or contrary to His Word. I hope that makes sense. The Bible's enough. It's sufficient. It's enough to make it spiritually complete. Now, some of you may be thinking, Pastor Andrew, you're just going off on a tangent here. You're nitpicking. It's just semantics. Well, sometimes semantics really matter. Sometimes words really matter, particularly the words of God. In fact, God's words matter so much to him that he wrote to us in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 20. He says, but the prophet, that's the one who speaks a word from God. The prophet, but the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. And if you say in your heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not happen or come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. That prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him. In other words, he said he, was, he presumed. He thought it was a word from God but it really wasn't. That prophet needs to die because it didn't come from me. He lied about my word. We could read a lot of passages like this in the word, but clearly God takes his word very seriously and he's offended when someone says he said something he didn't say. So let's be careful, church family, to never say God said something to us that he didn't say apart from his word. Some think the Holy Spirit told them to to do something, and it was their own deceptive heart that told them to do something, often contrary to his word. Now, the moment that we say, I had this divine revelation apart from God's word, that God told me this, that's the moment, and it, if it did not happen, that's the moment we would have been killed in the Old Testament. That's the moment that we become more like Satan in imposing words on God that he never actually said. Now, here's the deal. The good news is this. Seeking out a new word from God is not necessary. He has revealed himself with such clarity, such beauty, and his Holy Spirit brings it to life. It's not necessary. He's revealed himself. His Spirit personalizes it to our hearts through conviction and illumination and wisdom and guidance as he, he, he counsels us. God's Word is sufficient so we can be complete and equipped for every good work. Now, last thing I want to point out here is that the Bible commands pastors to teach the Word. Now, we should all be self-feeders. The Christian doesn't have to go through a priest or a pastor to get to God. We can prayerfully take it in on our own. We praise God for that. Now, all of us should be teaching our children, and we should be teachers of the Lord. But God has uniquely designed his church where he's appointed some to be pastors or pastor teachers. He's gifted some in the church to be teachers in order to teach his word. Look at what Paul tells, and we'll wrap up after this. What Paul tells the young pastor, Timothy, in chapter 4, is just a, a verse over, verse number 1. He says, I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine 
but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you, be watchful in all things, endure inflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Unfortunately, we live in a time where many, even Christians, seem to be bored and put off by sound doctrine. It's like, that's, they're bored by it. Some seek to find a teacher who's going to tell them exactly what they already want to hear. They're drawn by their own desires. They've got these itching ears. If that's you, you're probably not going to be very happy at Valley Baptist. But if you want a church that's going to do everything she can to tell you the truth, the real truth from God, if you want pastors who read the Word and explain the Word, if you want a church who does her best to continue steadfastly in the Apostles' Doctrine, then Valley Baptist might be the church home God's leading you to. Because that's what we've done for decades now. And by God's grace, that's what we'll continue steadfastly in.